we can start the domain adaptation topic. What is this about? You can sort of classify this under the umbrella of transfer learning, but uh, it's a little bit different. So you need to be a little bit more relaxed in how you define transfer learning. The transfer learning that we are used to are the type of transfer learning that we were doing with BERT language model, GPT type of language models, or even the paradigm of pre-training on, let's say, ImageNet type of data and then transferring the weights to a downstream task. So the transfer learning in the narrow sense that we are used to is the paradigm of pre-training fine-tuning. Domain adaptation is a little bit different. So you need to be a little bit more relaxed and in how you define transfer learning. But the concept is you have some data which are labeled. You have plenty of them. You have some unlabeled data and uh, you don't really care about the type of data, the source data that have labels. You want to minimize the risk of making errors on the target data, which has no labels. So think of this scenario that you want to build robots or you want to do self-driving cars. You can collect a lot of data in a simulated environment. You're going to be able to simulate your physics. You're going to be able to simulate how light is going to transfer. You're going to be able to collect a lot of data. That data is going to be labeled, but there is going to be a reality gap between simulated data and what happens in the real life with a real self-driving car or with a real uh, robot. And there is going to be a domain shift from simulation to real life, real data. And this is uh, the methodology to deal with that domain shift or shift in the data distribution is called domain adaptation. The good thing is if you have a framework to adapt from one domain to another domain, then you can generate a lot of simulated data and then transfer your learnings to real life. That's the idea. Mathematically speaking, what are you doing? You can have unsupervised domain adaptation. And let's start simple with the task of classification. And we just, we saw a lot of the problems can be uh, considered under the, under the umbrella of actually class classification. So this is a large class of problems that we are attacking. You have a source domain. S stands for source. In that source domain, you have NS data, and usually NS is large. And whenever I say source domain, think of a simulated environment where you know your ground truth. It's very easy to label stuff in a simulator. It's very easy to know your semantic maps. It's very easy to know your bounding boxes. So you're going to have plenty of labeled data. And these could be images. And these could be labels. I is counting your data or your observations. And NS is the total number of observations in your source domain. Your target domain doesn't have any labels. Hence the name unsupervised domain adaptation. And whenever I say target domain, think of the real world. The real images, real text, real speech. And these are images from the real world. Maybe a self-driving car is driving in unreal uh, roads. And this is your target domain. They don't have any labels. And you have NT of them. NT could be small, could be large, but NS is usually large. You have a lot of them. And what do you want in the end? You can easily create a classifier on your source domain. But then if you take that classifier, apply it to the target domain, to the target images, it's going to fail. It's not going to do such a great job because of the shift in the distribution of the data. Simulated data is different from real data. In the end, you want to build a classifier, which is going to minimize the target risk. What do I mean by that? You need a classifier. Let's set a notation for it. It takes perhaps images as input, and it's going to output labels. It's going to be parameterized. This is going to be your neural network. And what do I mean by target risk? You can think of it as the error rate of your classifier, the number of times that the prediction of your classifier is different from the actual value. 
And these are usually on some test data and it's okay to have test data to test your algorithm before putting it into production on the target domain. So you have some labels for some real images to compute your target risk. And target risk is your error rate. Think of accuracy, it's the one minus your accuracy. This is the target risk, the error rate. Hence epsilon here standing for E, error. Sometimes you might be a little bit relaxed. You might have not only images in your target domain, perhaps some of those images are also labeled in the real world. Those real images are labeled. And this is gonna end up being semi-supervised. But if you have a framework that works for unsupervised domain adaptation, this is actually a luxury so to have some labeled data in your target domain. So if you have a solution for unsupervised domain adaptation, you're gonna have a solution for semi-supervised adaptation. So let's stick with unsupervised. What is the idea? You're gonna be doing multi-layer adaptation and multi-kernel MMD. MMD stands for maximum mean discrepancy. So don't be afraid of these jargons. Things are gonna become clear soon. What can you do? You have some data in your source domain, your target domain. A could be either S or T, and you have some labels for them. Up until this point, you can use your cross-entropy loss to optimize over the parameters of your neural network. But then you don't have enough labels in your target domain, if any labels at all. So you have to somehow mitigate that fact that you don't have any labels and whatever that you're training here might not end up being transferable. And that's why you need these uh, other distance. And this is multi-layer because you have perhaps layer six, seven, and eight. You are considering those from your neural network. You are doing something at the feature level, and this is gonna end up being clear soon. So if you don't understand this part, you have the right not to understand it because I need to break it apart. The entire contribution is gonna be this red notation. The rest of it, we know how to do. What do we have? You have a neural network. Maybe some of your weights are frozen. Maybe you're doing transfer learning in the classical sense, or maybe they don't have to be frozen. You can fine tune them. And then your neural network is gonna have two heads. For one of the heads, you know the corresponding labels. For the other head, let's go to the extreme and assume that you don't have any labels to train this. So these guys, you have labels. These guys, you don't have any labels. It means that these weights are not gonna be learnable unless you somehow transfer features from the source domain to the target domain. But once the training is done, then it is game over. You show it an image, you look at this head, and then you're gonna read off the corresponding labels or predictions. It's all about training uh, these weights without having any, any labels, any corresponding target labels. Okay, so far so good. Now let's go back to this notation. You have some images in your source domain. These are simulated images. You take them, you push them through an architecture. This could be a convolutional neural network, and then you're gonna stop at some layer, maybe the sixth la layer, seventh layer, or the eighth layer of that neural network. And this is gonna give you some featureized images from the source domain. So these are images, you push them through neural networks, these are gonna give you featureized images. And these are these uh, green circles that you see here. These are your H. You do the same thing for your target images. You push them through your neural network, you stop at the Elf layer, and these are the featureized target images. Now you have two sets, NS and NT. Now you need to write down a distance on two sets. You're gonna borrow uh, an idea from kernel-based methods, and you're gonna say that K is a convex combination of M kernels. What is a convex combination? You have a bunch of weights that add up to one, they are positive, and K is a linear combination of those kernels. KUs. What is KU? It could be a Gaussian kernel. What is that? If two points are close to each other, maybe they are very close, this is going to end up being zero. Exponential of zero is one. So this function is going to take a maximum value of one. In the cases where H, J, and H, I are very different from each other, 
they're distant apart, this is going to go to zero exponentially fast. Okay, so first of all, now we are going to be defining our distance between two sets, two sets of featureized source and target images. So this distance is at the feature level, and this is exactly what you're putting here. What are you doing? If you have two images in your source domain, you want to encourage diversity of those featureized images. You want your features, you want these uh, green uh, circles to be as diverse as possible, to be as different as possible from each other when you're comparing pairs of images. And why is that? Why does this kernel do that? Because if you're trying to minimize this, you are basically trying to minimize an exponential term with a minus here of some distance. This is going to happen if these two, hi and hj, are further away from each other. So you're making h to be different from one image to another image. You're scattering your featureized images in the source domain. You do the same thing to a target. You want them to be as diverse as possible. At the same time, you want the source and target to be similar. This is where the transfer happens. That's why you have a minus here. If you're minimizing this, you're basically maximizing this guy. And this guy is maximized when HS and HT are close to each other. But you're not doing this individually, you're doing it on average. Hence the name mean discrepancies because the discrepancy of these features matter. And this is the term that you're putting here. And that's the way that uh, similarity between these feature spaces are happening. Okay, so not only you're classifying, but also you're trying to make these features similar to each other and at the same time as discriminative as possible. This is costly to do so the same way that attention mechanism was costly. This one is also costly because each source image needs to pay attention or uh, compare itself to the target images. But there is a smart way of computing that. And for that, we can see the paper. We can solve that problem using linear complexity. Okay? So that's just a minor detail. It's important for your algorithm to actually end up in reasonable time, but uh, we are going to see better ways of solving this problem. Okay? There is another detail here. And the question is, how are we going to set Bs unlike supervised learning? Here, you don't have any validation data to set these hyperparameters. So you can actually learn betas by maximizing over k. k is basically a linear combination of your k use. And if you see here that you're saying maximizing over k, you're basically maximizing over betas. And then this is the estimation variance of your data. So don't worry too much about this. In the end of the day, there is a way to set beta you know your kernel, you know your distance, and your distance is trying to make things at the feature level similar to each other. Let's see some numerical results. There is this data set, Office 31. It's a benchmark for domain adaptation. So make sure that you explore that data set. In that data set, you are gonna have images of products uh, from Amazon, from Amazon's website. You're gonna have images taken by a webcam, or you're going to have images taken by a usual camera. And then you want to do transfer. You want to transfer from Amazon images to webcam images. You want to transfer from DSLR to webcam images and back and forth. And the DAN, Deep Adaptation Networks, is doing the best among the existing methods. What else? You can actually transfer across data sets perhaps Office 10 to Caltech. Office 10 is similar to what you have here, Amazon Webcam DSLR, and Caltech 10, you can also take a look at it. And then you can transfer from Amazon images to Caltech 10 images, Webcam images to Caltech 10 images, and so on. And this one is also giving you the highest accuracy. But I want to end with this sentence. This is actually a theorem in that paper. We don't have time to cover the proof, but this is actually a very important one. When you are minimizing this maximum mean discrepancy, it is actually equivalent to maximizing the error of a classifier that is classifying between source and target. And with that classifier, you can actually think of it as a discriminator. 
which is discriminating between source images, target images. And what you're doing by minimizing this distance, you're actually trying to make that discriminator make a mistake. And this should ring a bell. We have been doing this framework for a while now when we were doing generative adversarial networks. We had a generative process that was trying to make a discriminator make a mistake. Here, things are happening at the feature level. You want these features not to be discriminable. You don't want these features to give away information about you're looking at a source image. You're looking at a target image. You want these features to be confusing. You want these features not to be discriminable. And that's exactly what you're doing with this framework. Any questions so far? Was everything clear? Okay, perfect.